So I want to tell you about energy transfer. Obviously, I'm not here, so I'll upload this later on into YouTube so you can watch it later if you wish to. But what we're going to attempt to be figuring out is what's the role of physics in ecosystems because physics is kind of a big deal, so it clearly has something to do with ecosystems. <clears throat> now, obviously, feel free to pause this if you need more time to copy stuff down. I'm just going to kind of blitzkrieg through it, and then you can stretch it out however you wish. So one of the things that we need to remember and I know we've beaten this horse to death, but might as well say it a few more times, is the environment is the one that turns out to dictate the conditions that allow organisms to match that environment. You have a whole bunch of varieties, and whatever doesn't turn out to best suit that environment, we eliminate, and that's the process of natural selection. You don't end up adapting to the environment. The environment ends up kind of, sort of, selecting the organisms that best fit and the way it does that is by having the best reproductive success. Obviously, you can look at this silly little picture here, but the images of human evolution here do somewhat reflect the type of environment that you would find those individuals. The other thing, which turned out to be from the lecture on Tuesday, is if we deal with interactions. And obviously, all living things are going to interact, and the question is, how do those choose to interact? They're usually going to be interacting due to attempting to acquire resources. Resources, of course, are food, shelter, and space, and every once in a while, a partner with which to mate. Depending on the type of interaction, that will determine if you're attempting to get resources or outcompete another for, in for resources or just acquire them from someone else or help each other gain resources. If you were to change the type of interactions that occur, you end up forcing evolution to occur. If you change the environment, which is what we would call ecological succession, what that would result in is a change in the conditions, which means we now need to shift what type of organisms best suit that environment. We can see that quite specifically, like I said, with ecological succession, because basically we're clearing out the landscape, clearing out all the trees, and starting over, which means different organisms get to fit into that environment. So obviously we change the conditions, the biotic and abiotic factors. We have to change what lives there, sorry. Nose got dried. And it makes it hard to breathe. Oh well. TMI. <clears throat> so most of those interactions that we deal with involve some type of consumption and that's what we call a trophic level so I think you can see this mouse hopefully you can what you end up getting are a few levels so we get an area of trophism that we would call the producers those would be the things that end up producing the food they undergo photosynthesis or in a handful of cases of another process called chemosynthesis that we don't necessarily talk about but we can if you wanted to and then those organisms typically end up producing more energy than is necessary. So another set of organisms, what we would call consumers, could go and eat the producers. They acquire energy from the producers. There could be other consumers that eat those first set of consumers, and we also would call those consumers. But as we go up the scale of consumers, we call them primary, secondary, tertiary. Much like with proteins, primary is the first level, second dairy would be the second row of eating, tertiary would be the third row. There's usually some type of top carnivore and things like that for consumer. This here is what we would call a food chain and they don't necessarily exist but we'll talk about that in a bit. This particular food chain or this trophic structure, troph as you know because you just took a roots quiz, means feeding. So this chain here is actually missing something, and that is there's something that has to eat the top, the tertiary consumers or the quaternary consumers, whatever it turns out to be once they're dead, and that's what we call a decomposer. So we're missing decomposers in this one, so there's a flaw in this picture, and what we need to do is add a little arrow saying decomposers are in here, but they would come off of all of these organisms. Much like was alluded to yesterday, Food chains are far not complex enough. I, my mind went somewhere else. 
they're not complex enough to match reality. So in reality, what we see are things that we call food webs, which show you all the different versions of interaction, these trophic interactions that exist. Somewhere within a food web, which helps describe an ecological location, what we would call an ecosystem, there's a type of organism that stabilizes it all, and it's referred to as a keystone species. The only way that you would know by looking at this A that the sea otter turns out to be the keystone is if you eliminate the sea otter, well, what results? Well, if you look and start counting them up, you notice that, what, roughly half of the species disappear from this particular food web, which means it turns out to be the keystone. Here in this picture, it's one of the tertiary, con it's one of the top consumers. It does not necessarily need to be a top consumer in order to make it the keystone. The only way you can determine if an organism is a keystone or not is you need to eliminate it. And that, unfortunately, is what humans are particularly good at doing. Well, why are we eating to obtain energy? Well, if we're talking energy, we need to kind of backtrack and rethink of where all this energy stuff is coming from. The primary source of all energy in an ecosystem would be the sun. So the way that that turns out to work, of course, is photosynthesis. We have the sun emitting light, light in various forms, and it's going to be absorbed by various pigments, which are going to be found inside of photosystems. Photosystem 2 is the first one. Photosystem 1 is the second one. In photosystem, what we do is we take sunlight, we excite some electrons, we bounce those electrons around, and by bouncing those electrons around, what we can do is pump protons, the pumping of protons causes a concentration gradient. It also causes a charge gradient. We use that, which is chemosynthesis, or a membrane potential through the process of chemosynthesis to produce a or ATP, which is written down here. You have those electrons that are bouncing around. We need to dump them somewhere. They have high energy, so we dump them onto this molecule called NADPH, P for photosynthesis, even though that's not true. In order to replenish those electrons, we take water, we rip it apart into oxygen, protons, and electrons. It's the source of oxygen that we had, or we have on Earth. This process here produced energy. If we wish to maintain or keep that energy, we convert it into some type of storage vessel, which is chemical energy. That's the process of the Calvin cycle, which of course will produce some type of sugary compound. We usually write it as C6H1206, but that's not necessarily true. In the Calvin cycle, we take carbon dioxide and we fix it, meaning we attach it to something that already exists. The one that we attach it to is RUBP, which is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, with an enzyme called Rubisco, which is a very inefficient and horrible enzyme. It attaches, it ends up forming through a really horrible complex process that I believe I showed you all in class, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that you, of course, recall, and then that there gets turned into whatever you need it to be. This is the source of energy for virtually everything on Earth, this particular process. If we shut this process off, we're all done for. Well, the catch is, we have the producers that make all of that energy, and they can produce some amount, but whatever. If you go and you eat the producer, we would like to think that, oh, well, if you consumed 100 calories worth of food, that you get to keep the all 100 calories. And the answer is actually, no, you don't you at best will get to hold about 10% or 10 of those calories, of those 100 calories that you consume. The reason for that is a law of physics called thermodynamics. This turns out to be the equation for the second law of thermodynamics, or at least one of them. What it basically says is free energy has something to do with heat, temperature, and chaos. Moral of the story is no matter how you rig this equation, Delta G must be negative. If you want something to occur, it must be negative. So any type of natural process will result in a loss of energy. Meaning, if you consume 100 calories worth of food, you don't get to keep the 100 calories. You're going to lose at least 90 of those calories. As what? As heat. Everything gets lost as heat. So if we maintain this 90% gets lost and 10% remains, and even then, it's at best 10% remains. It's not you do keep 10%. It's at best you keep 10%. We call this the 10% rule whenever we look at some type of feeding structure. So we have producers here at 1,000. 
well, the primary consumer, the thing that will eat the producer, would get 10%. That's where that 100 came from. And then we happen to have some voles right here that are eating the grasshoppers, secondary consumers. They get 10% of the 100, which is 10 calories. KCALs are what you would call a calorie, which is a capital C calorie. KCALs stand for thousands of calories. If you go to Europe, they actually report things in KCALs or KJs, which are kilojoules, which is a different unit of energy. And then if you have something that eats the voles, like an owl, they would get the owl would get at best 10% of the 10 calories, which would be one. So that's how the 10% rule turns out to work. It also reveals itself in a whole bunch of other ways, that 10% rule. And it has something to do with numbers and other things that we can look at. So again, the 10% rule, we just drop by 10% every single time. Virtually all of that energy is going to be lost as heat. That remaining 10% can either be passed on to the next predator or it moves on to decomposers. Because after all, at some point, we're all going to be mulch. Unless you get cremated. But that's being a horrible thing for the environment. You should totally not be cremated. Although it does take up less space. So the decomposers end up taking over whatever is left behind. So what you end up, th if you really think about it, for a primary consumer to get a lot of energy, they need to consume a lot of producers. To get it, for a secondary consumer to get a lot of energy, they need to eat a lot of primary consumers. For for apex or tert or quaternary consumer, for them to receive a lot of energy, they need to consume a lot of tertiary consumers, which need to eat a lot of secondary consumers, which need to eat a lot of primary consumers, which need to eat a lot of primary producers. We as omnivores can kind of like stay somewhere else within here so we can kind of shuffle around as to where we turn out to be although typically things don't go eating us because we try and outsmart that but if we really wanted to actually acquire enough energy really fast we would just eat the producers you wouldn't eat cows you wouldn't eat pigs you wouldn't eat fish you would just eat the plants that the cows and the fish and the pigs consume it's actually a far more efficient way to obtain calories. And if we actually did that, we wouldn't have to have as much meat being produced. And that actually would save even more food. And that would actually allow for everyone to have food on Earth. So that whole, oh, we have a food crisis. No, not necessarily. All we have to do is change what we eat. And there's also global warming ramifications for all that. But we'll save that for a different time. This here would be an energy or a biomass pyramid. Biomass is just basically how much stuff there turns out to be or how much growth you have. Production is a fancy way of saying how much did you gain. gain what do you mean by gain? Gain in size. When we talk about size, we usually talk about some type of mass. So production here. Technically, this is actually productivity, not production, but whatever. So this is mass per area in some length of time. So grams per square meter per year tells you how much you can end, actually end up growing within a certain area over a certain amount of time. And actually this is productivity, not production. Production is just how much did you make. But what you notice is the higher up you go on the food in a food pyramid or a very simple food chain, that the numbers start to drop off really fast in terms of the mass. It's not quite following the 10% rule because it depends on the organism and how efficient they are and things like that. But you do notice that there's a rather rapid decrease. We would see this also if we looked at the numbers of organisms. That F, that's osprey, not 10 spray. That's one osprey, which is a fish. Or pardon me, it's a bird. Why do I think fish? Oh, pike. There we go. So as we move up, some type of food chain, which again is just a little portion of a food web, what we would notice is the numbers seem to decrease. We, they won't necessarily be by the 10% rule, but they decrease. The other thing that turns out to happen, and it's worth noting, is if energy kind of flows in one particular direction, meaning it goes from sun to heat, we need something else because 
we're dealing with an organism, so something's being consumed. There are parts, there are atoms and molecules being consumed, so those need to be put somewhere. And it turns out we do keep that in mind when we make a food web. We just don't explicitly say it, and that's what we call a nutrient cycle. The reason behind that is there's a law of chemistry called the conservation of mass or the conservation of matter, which is basically whatever you dump in, you have to get out. If you put in 10 grams into a beaker, you're going to get out 10 grams worth of stuff from a beaker. Whatever the mass is that we have on Earth for us to consume, that's what stays behind. So somehow or another, all the stuff cycles through. The easiest of these cycles, and I'm not going to go through all the nitty-gritty of these, would be the carbon-oxygen cycle. This seems to be a balance between photosynthesis and respiration. As easy as that. Because both of those cycles involve oxygen and CO2. What makes it complicated is, well, how can you release oxygen? How do you release carbon? How do you consume carbon? How do you consume oxygen? Things that we tend not to think about would be if we're dealing with factories or other type of burning situations, fossil fuels or natural fires or things like that. If we have things that are decaying, that's going to cause the release of carbon and the consumption of oxygen. But we also have things that are like being fossilized and being turned into lignite and into coal and that's being stuck somewhere. And as long as that stays there, it's kind of serving as a carbon trap. Ocean serves as a carbon trap. So we it's far more complicated than we would like it to be. And for all these, you don't necessarily need to memorize them all, but you should have a general idea as to what goes on. Water cycle, a little more complicated than what you probably saw in the seventh grade. Hopefully this is something that, for those of you who took apes last year, you recognize a little bit more. Hey, look, it says evapotranspiration. You should know what transpiration is right now. But what we have is basically moisture goes up into the air, moisture comes back on down. And it's just a matter of how does it move throughout the environment. And that's where we start dealing with groundwater. And we have things being trapped. And then you have infiltration and water being trapped in locations and blah, blah, blah. The nitrogen cycle I'm pretty sure you talked about because it deals with some other odd phenomena that's called eutrophication. So when we deal with the nitrogen cycle, what we have to deal with is taking nitrogen, which is most of the air, and shoving it into organic things. That's a process called fixation, because fixing is whenever you stick it into something organic. That happens in only two ways that we know of. Basically, one of them is lightning, the other one is bacteria. There are other ways that we can do it, but they're not as particularly good. But lightning and bacteria are the ways that we, for the most part, fix. And then what we can do is we take that stuff, shove it into some type of organic material, and then the question is, well, what do you do with it? Well, you can either turn it into rocks, or you can recycle it within organisms. You can have it be lost back into the air. You can have it run into the ocean or into some other body of water. We can end up burning it off. It's all sorts of things. Just for the sake of pointing out these words, ammonium is something that has a positive charge, ammonia turns out to be NH3, which is the smell of urine. Nitrification, a nitrite is an NO2. If you add another oxygen to it, we turn the I into an A, which is why it's called a nitrate. And hooray and hip hip. Ammonium is the useful form of nitrogen for us. Nitrates are very easy to turn into gases, <clears throat> although plants turn out to be liking nitrates. The last of these cycles would be the phosphorus cycle, which is a very slow cycle because it involves decomposition of rocks, and then which is what we would call weathering, and then we have the formation of phosphates, phosphates, which are PO4 compounds, which for the most part precipitate out, meaning they cause solids if you dump them into water. But what you have to get is these things being fault being brought up into the land, having them become weathered, as they weather and they fall apart, you have the phosphates freed again and you're hoping that they get absorbed by plants which we end up consuming and we put it into our bodies because that's what we use for ATP, it's the P of ATP, we use it in DNA and RNA and things like that, and a DPH, which we actually use too, it's not just a plant thing. But then we can also have a cycle going on there too.
that turns out to be it. So needless to say, energy is a big deal inside of, a, inside of an ecosystem, namely because what we have to have is a flow of energy from producers to consumers, and eventually it dumps back into, I thought I had one that showed it, into decomposers, because decomposers are the ones that recycle. Why do we recycle? Well, as energy flows from sun towards the useless version, which is heat, the materials that you're made out of get recycled by decomposers, and that goes through what we call the nutrient cycle, such as the carbon oxygen cycle, water cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. There are other cycles outside of this, but these are the ones that are usually big deals. So that's that. Feel free to pause. I'll post this online, like I said.